103, if you'd find that in your Bible, Psalms 109, I'm sorry. Right in the middle of your Bible is the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 109. I'll be uh, just in one passage in Peter in the New Testament in a little bit if you want to find that. I sure appreciate you coming. And um, you that are listening online, if you would let us know you're listening, that would be great. Uh, send a text, send a check, <laughs> make <laughs> a phone call. Uh, we are trying to uh, redo our church membership and church uh, roles and records and, and, um, and update things. And there's uh, membership cards in the back as far as just updating records, names, phone numbers, that kind of thing. Sure appreciate everybody doing that. And I know some of you are not getting out. You're at home watching online, and that's great. Um, I just encourage you to let us know you're there so we don't uh, hit the delete button and take your name out of the book of life. <laughs> that's, you know, hate to have that happen, you know. So anyway, we, I'm glad you are here. And uh, let's pray for one another, pray for our country. Certainly our country is in need, and, and uh, we, we, uh, there's no problem outside the hand of God. Everything else is okay. You just stay near to God and everything. Let's stand for a moment and look at Psalms 109, 109, starting at verse 21. I'm going to read a few verses if you'd follow along in your Bible. Psalm 109, verse 21. And um, Psalm 109, verse 21. But do thou for me, O God, for thy name's sake, because thy mercy is good, deliver thou me. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. That's our text. I'm poor and needy, my heart is wounded within me. I'm gone like the shadow when it declineth. I'm tossed up and down as a locust. My knees are weak through fasting. My flesh faileth of fatness. That is no American's verse. Sorry about that. Verse 25, I became a reproach unto them. When they looked upon me, they shake their head. Help me, O Lord, my, or, O Lord, my God, O save me according to thy mercy, that they may know that this is thy hand, and that thou, Lord, hast done it. And let's pray. Help us today as we look at your book, Lord, uh, to gain some wisdom and some truth. And you know everybody here has different needs, so I'm just looking and thinking about this matter of faith. Uh, some have been saved for decades and they've been reading this book, and it's been their best friend for many. And we ask for your hand to be on each one. Many of our young people looking with direction, uh, seeking uh, what and, and where for the future. We pray you'd help us, please, and give that uh, to each one what they need. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open there to Psalms 109. And we'll look there. I was reading this week and, and uh, came across a quote. Uh, there's a book called A Chance to Die. I'd recommend any of you get it, especially, uh, I think especially it's a good ladies book. It's, it's a biography of Amy Carmichael who spent 50 years in India. Never went home one time. Packed up, left home, and uh, spent the next 50 years on the mission field. Um, but the, the book A Chance to Die is written by Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot's husband was Jim Elliot who went down with some friends to work with the Aka Indians in Central, Calif Central California, uh, <laughs> Central America. There, um, they prepared and planned and prayed and they landed their plane on the river, came up on shore to make that first physical contact and they were all killed. And uh, the bodies of all those men were seen from the spotter plane that was kind of watching to see what happened. And a pretty famous story uh, through Gates of Splendors, a book written on it, and then uh, I think they've probably made movies about it. But uh, what isn't told as much is the life of the ladies, the wives of those men who were killed. They went eventually back in the next couple of years, and they went to the place where their husbands were killed and uh, they ended up getting more people to go with them, winning the hearts of the Indians, the natives there. And I saw the video where they had an ordination service and I think there was 15 or 18 of those Aka Indians ordained to the gospel ministry. 
because some ladies believed God was still good when they didn't understand. So Elizabeth Elliot, her first husband, was killed by the natives. He went to tell of Christ. She married again some years later, and he died of cancer. And through that and many other experiences, living with the Auk Indians for a long, long time, lived down there, raised her kids down there, uh, she said this as she was writing the book, A Chance to Die. That's the biography of, of Amy Carmichael, A Chance to Die. And she says this, whatever is in the cup that God is offering me, whether it be pain or sorrow and suffering and grief, along with many more joys, I'm willing to take it because I trust him. And then she said this, because suffering is never for nothing. That's a mouthful for a gal who had one husband killed in the ministry and the other husband killed by disease and raising your family in a, in a primitive way beyond third world country, all for the cause of Christ. And, and she said, I'll drink whatever is in the cup God hands me because I will trust him. That's huge. And that's a Christianity that we know very little about. So as we look at Psalm 109, we'll see a little bit of that. And so I'd like to go through those verses just real quickly and uh, probably have a shorter sermon than normal this morning, although I never really know what normal is. But I didn't get breakfast, so that's a good sign for you that we'll get out earlier rather than later. Psalms 109, look down at, at verse 21. But do thou for me, O God the Lord, for thy name's sake. You'll see this over and over in the Bible. Now, this is prophetically pointing to Jesus Christ and, and to um, his life, but it also is firsthand the life of King David. And he said, I need you to do some things for me, but the difference between modern Christianity and Bible Christianity is this. We say, do this for me, exclamation point. David said, do this for me, for thy name's sake. God, work me through this situation in a way that you would be glorified. Look at verse 22. For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. Now, there are physical wounds, but as most of you that are very old at all know, the, the heart wounds are more grievous than the body wounds. The body heals much quicker than a heart and he says, I'm poor, I'm needy, and my heart, not only am I poor, not only am I needy, my heart has been wounded. And this morning, I want to talk about wounded, uh, a wounded heart. And uh, go on to verse 23 just quickly. I'm gone like the shadow when it declineth. I'm gone, I'm tossed uh, up and down like a locust. Verse 24, my knees are weak through fasting. And, you know, sometimes we've been talking about fasting lately and and I dealt uh, at a Sunday night sermon, the last sermon of January on fasting. But, but someone says, well, I can't fast. I'd just be exhausted. Yeah, he said, I am, my knees are weak through fasting and my flesh faileth of fatness. There just isn't any jiggle left. <laughs> this, oh, this great preacher, I heard him, he, was, he said he joined the, the Navy when he went into Vietnam because they were drafting and he knew he'd get drafted. He said, I figured I would rather choose where to go. So I joined the Navy because I'd rather be floating around on a boat in the middle of the ocean than walking through the jungles in Vietnam. He said, I joined the Navy and they put me on an 18 foot aluminum boat going up rivers right into Vietnam. <laughs> and and he, he didn't do it running from God. He just didn't want to be in the jungle being shot at, had a grenade blow up in his hand. A uh, phosphorus grenade said, I uh, looked down in the water and I saw my face looking back at me. Uh, but early part of the story, when he joined, he was a little overweight. And he said, we did our first mile run. We're all standing at attention. I jiggled for five minutes. <laughs> so, oh, anyway, God, uh, you know, you can grumble or you can trust God. It's up to you. But either way, God's going to get his way. But in verse, uh, verse 25, I'm, be I'm, also, I'm become also a reproach unto them when they look upon me they shake their head the uh, he's talking about his physical problems in verse 24 he's he's doing without by choice or by necessity he's physically he's failing physically and then in verse 25 he's being mocked 
And of course, all this can go to Calvary and to Jesus on the cross, but it has to do with David as well. Verse 26, help me, O Lord, my God. O save me according to thy mercy. And then verse 27, they, that, again, the, the motive for his prayers, that they may know that this is thy hand, that thou, Lord, hast done it. He said the reason, the reason he was asking for help was not because he needed help. He was asking for help so God would be glorified. He wasn't asking for help because his old car keeps breaking down and he needs a new car. He's asking for help to, to, to help me in such a way that, that your name, Lord, would be lifted up. But I'd like you to notice one little phrase in verse 27, that they may know that this is thy hand. That this is thy hand. One of the things that we, uh, we all of us, especially in our country right now, we're so prosperous. It's really hard for us to accept the fact that God would do anything to us. In fact, I've heard, I've heard uh, preachers say God never would do anything evil. The devil does bad things, but God would not do bad things. And, and you can get into theological debate. The devil can't do anything without God's permission or whatever. But you want to read in Isaiah, he says, I am the Lord. I create light. I create darkness. I create good. I create evil. Uh, Proverbs, the Lord says, uh, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. God uses bad. There's no way around it. You cannot, you cannot be an open-minded Bible reader and not realize that Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery, lied about and put into prison in order to have nations, literal nations, be delivered. God has no problem, let me be real blunt, God has no problem hurting you or me if it will help others. We believe that. Every, per, every one of our young people that puts a uniform on, whether it be law enforcement or military, every one of them, we're accepting the idea that it's okay that some of these are hurt in order to save others. We, we believe that. Every, every athletic coach believes that. Let me hurt you to make you better. And no, you got to be a sadistic sort of person to be a coach. But, but in, in uh, verse 27, he says, in verse 26, he says, help me. Verse 27, that they may know this is thy hand. So he's going through this trial. He's passing through these hardships and these burdens. And he says, God, I need help in this thing in such a way that it'll be obvious you're involved. Most of us, we just want out of our trouble. We'd like to lose weight while we eat more. We'd like to be in better shape while we exercise less. You know, we, again, we're all in this. This is me. It's not just any individual. We all have the idea that if we'll be good and treat people good, everybody will be nice to us. That's really stupid. I mean, if you think that, you must not even be in school yet. Because I learned that in kindergarten. <laughs> People are bad. They just are. And, and uh, some of them do it accidentally. Some of them do it intentionally. Some of them are just stupid. They were born that way. I have no idea what. Keep your finger here in case we have time to come back. Go over to 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to talk about this thing of being wounded almost to the end of your Bible. First and 2 Peter, if you find that right before the book of Revelation, 1 Peter chapter 2. We get wounded. In some cases, your friends let you down. And again, that starts early on. That can start in grade school. That could start in your teenage years. When uh, I remember many years ago, my wife and I were talking about somebody in our church, a young person. I forget if they're high school or college, but I think it was college age. And they're in a pretty serious relationship. And then somebody broke up with one of them, broke up with the other one. And, you know, there's heartbreak. And, and I mentioned, you know, I felt bad for them going through that. And she said, oh, no, it's good for them. This is mercy. That's truth. <laughs> And uh, she said, it's good to go through a heartbreak and realize you can make it. And I think, well, I think it's really better to not go through the heartbreak. <laughs> but it's not realistic. You're going to go through some heartbreak. You look there at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, and uh, talking about Jesus being abused. The, the, the man, the God-man Christ, not only did he die for your sins, but look there with, with me at verse 22 and 23. Who did, verse 22 of 1 Peter 2, who did no sin, neither was guile 
found in his mouth, no deceitful words, no bitter words. Obviously, he was not on Facebook. Um, verse 20, I'm teasing. You can stay on your social media. It's okay. Keep these liberal people with lots of money to, to corrupt the world. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't answer back. He didn't try to argue his way through things. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now that last line is the one that's, that's important. When he, when he suffered in verse 23, he didn't threaten anybody. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Jesus is being accused. Jesus is being slandered. Jesus is being ridiculed. Then he's suffering physically. And, and you know, he could have turned them all into cockroaches if he wanted to. But he didn't respond. He didn't retaliate. But instead, he looked to the heavenly father and committed himself to him who judgeth. If you notice that last phrase, committed himself to him who judgeth righteously. Because the fact is, if I tried to get even with you, the odds of it being righteous would be pretty slim. If you and I tried to straighten out the political issue in America, do you think we'd get it right? I mean, are we a gifted group here? I think so. We wouldn't get it right. And so the, the example he gives us in verse 23, he says that he didn't, and, and of course Jesus could have gotten it right, but he didn't. He was the perfect man who committed his suffering to the God of heaven who judges righteously. And you see, when God makes decisions, they're right decisions. When God makes uh, moves things here or there, it's always right. And when God makes a, a call on a circumstance, he's always right. And you might say, well, if God's always right, why the evil and why this? Because it's an evil, nasty old world. And there's a lot of people God's not going to necessarily work on like he will you. If you're saved today, you and I have a unique relationship. And I might look down the street and think, man, that kid's a devil. But I'm not going to treat the neighbor kid like I would my own kid. You know, my kid's going to get beat. I mean, they're going to get time out. Um, you know, the neighbor kid, I'm just going to look at him in disgust and ignore him. And if you're related to your heavenly father, he's going to work on you and work with you. I want to educate my children. I want to train my children. I want to give my children experience and, and uh, job training and practical training, academic training. So hopefully they'll have the tools that when they decide to do something with their life, they're able to. The neighbor, I just think, man, I wish we could get you something better, but, you know, it's up to your parents. The question is, do you have a heavenly father that you can trust? And what do we do when we're wounded? What do we do? You know, our friends are going to let us down. Sometimes your parents let you down. I mean, if we had the teenagers in this room raise their hand, did your parents ever let you down? We wouldn't do that. Um, sometimes, you know, you that are adults, your parents let you down. Um, you know, it's, I, I, some time ago they started talking about dysfunctional homes, and I just shook my head and thought, who's not dysfunctional? Yeah. I mean, is there any family that's not dysfunctional? Maybe, but if you are, we don't like you. <laughs> you know, who, is, who has not had some liquor here, drugs there, divorce here, unfaithful? What home doesn't have some of that? You know, you look at all of our military families. Who's not had a home where dad's gone three months, six months, nine months at a time. That's, that's not God's design for the, the ideal home. You just, you deal with it. You do what you've got to do. Sometimes work has caused you to be wounded in your heart. And uh, over and over, the stories are, are so common of uh, one, one couple in our, uh, a man in our church got in business with a guy who was not in our church. And he came to me later. He said, you know, I probably shouldn't have done it. I'm saved. He's not saved. And I got in a partnership with this guy and and I said no that's probably not the best idea and um, but it's already done and he ended up his partner uh, was the one doing all the, the the finance and the bookkeeping and all and and uh, he basically ignored everything that was legal and ended up the IRS coming and taking their business and taking everything they had and this guy lost all of his stuff because of who he chose to partner with in the business world and so maybe you've been wounded because of some work wrong or maybe uh, an employer messed up and the company closed down or whatever it might be. Um, people get wounded because of financial choices of others. 
People get wounded because of simple mistakes. You know, life is not, just life can wound you. Just life. Remember the story of the, the uh, Good Samaritan? Here's this guy, he's just walking down the road. On his way to Jericho, a good guy minding his own business. He falls among thieves. They rob him, take his clothes, take everything he's got. They beat him and leave him in the ditch, ditch nearly dead. That would be wounded. He didn't cause it. He didn't ask for it. He did nothing. He was on the planet and things go wrong. Now, somehow we've got to figure out how we're going to live in this world. You've got unjust people. You've got criminal people. Amy Carmichael told the story of her leaving. She was a uh, the young lady who uh, or I mentioned earlier, Elizabeth Elliot wrote her biography, and Amy Carmichael, had her dad had died, and she was helping her mom pay the bills and take care of the younger siblings. And, and one of the things she was doing was helping an, an elderly man, just looking after him, uh, his house and different things. She made some money, but she became very close to him like an adopted father. And, and she, she stayed there some time and li just literally fell in love with the man as, as a father. And... Um, and then God started working on her heart to go to the mission field. And she just heard the biggest heartbreak. She wasn't worried about leaving uh, all the conveniences. She was worried about him who'd take care of him. He was old. He was feeble. And he would probably die the week I left. And, and she was so burdened and brokenhearted. And these were her words. She said that my heart broke so desperately when I left him that 50 years later it has yet to mend. She never got over it. I remember foolishly as a young pastor, just been here a little while, a lady was going to our church. Her husband had been a World War II vet and had passed away, and they'd been married forever. And um, it was sometime after his funeral, and I was over at her house just chatting, and, and I said, it takes a while to get over it, doesn't it, or something like that. And she looked at me very sternly. She said, you don't get over it. I said, okay, we'll put that in my book. You don't get over it. <laughs> Uh, like if any of you ever um, met a, one dear lady in our church who got saved and I was knocking on doors, she had a dog whose belly drugged the floor. It was, uh, it was a doxy that had three doxy bellies. I mean, I've never seen a doxy so fat. And I just commented one day walking in and said, man, that is a big dog. She said, it's my dog. If I want a fat dog, it's none of your business. <laughs> okay, well, we're not going to talk about the dog. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask about your husband either. <laughs> but, uh, you learn this stuff in 40 years of ministry. You know why old people get grumpy? Because they do know a lot, and they've done a lot of stupid things. But, uh, you know, you don't get over some hurt. The wounding of the heart, and, and again, help me, just stick with me for a minute here. The wounding of the heart is a reality. What you do next is up to you. Isaiah 53, 5 tells of Jesus 600 years before his birth he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him if you ever get a chance to witness to a Jewish person that's a wonderful passage to turn to I love to look at that with a Jewish person now if you have a really liberal Jewish person who knows some Bible they'll tell you oh that's the nation of Israel but it's not. There's no way. Israel can't fit there. God does not lay the iniquities of the world on them. Anyway, it doesn't fit. But for the child of God, we, we know it's Jesus. He was wounded for our iniquities. So what did he do? He took it and he committed himself. You're there in 1 Peter 2, 22. He committed himself to him who judgeth righteously. You're wounded. It might have been none of, nothing of your own fault. It could be health. Could be finance, could be the circumstances of, of home, of children, of families. You know, we've got immigrants. I was preaching in Canada a few years ago and uh, met, of course, uh, uh, there's a Filipino family there because they're taking over the world. And I uh, thought, what are you doing here in the iceberg of north central Canada? And uh, we got talking about how they immigrated there. And, and uh, the husband said, well, I came over first and got a job and stayed there here in the the rules then were if you stayed a year and worked a whole year, then you could get your spouse. So they, he said, then I got my wife to come over. And then if we both worked for another year, then we could sponsor our children. And so he was gone from his kids for two years. His wife gone from his kids for a year to get them 
to this place in Canada where they could have a, a you know, what they wanted, a, you know, a good life. And they were all saved and faithful in a good Baptist church up there. But don't tell me that doesn't wound the kids. Don't tell me it doesn't wound the parents. Now, here's what the world today is telling you. You were wounded. And your job is to get even with everything and every person. Even if it was your great, great grandparents that were wounded. Somebody should make it right with you. Even though you've got a college degree and a nice house. Go figure that one out. Uh, I was hurt 40 years ago. We're, we're in a culture of let's, and, and, it, and folks, it never works right. Because bitterness and wrath and anger and malice hurts you. That's why the, the whole idea of forgiveness comes along. The idea, and I'm not saying that, like with Amy Carmichael, I'm not saying we've not been wounded. Uh, I think if we were to go around the room here, you'd be shocked how many wounded people there are in this room. Most of them said, I'm going to have to trust God and go on. Now, you can stay right here, and you can live right here in this wounded spot the rest of your life. You can spend your whole Christian life wounded and, and never go any further, or... You can say, you know what, back where we were, you, you lost your place probably. But look at the end of Psalms 109. If you, if you still have it, look there. If you don't, then don't look there. But at the end of verse um, Psalms 109, he says in verse 22, my heart is wounded within me. And down in verse 27, he says, that they may know that this is thy hand, that thou hast done it. And we struggle with the idea that God lets my dad leave when I'm little or has my mom in jail because of some, and I'm not talking about my family, <laughs> you know, some, my mom's here. She's not been in jail ever since I remember. But, uh, you know, you're being raised by people you don't even know. You don't really have any family. Hey, look, decide there's a God in heaven who's still alive in your world. Is it easy? No. We're not talking about the wounds going away. We're talking about going on. We won't turn there, but if you want to turn to the stories of Jesus, when we get to heaven and see him, it says we will look on him whom we pierced. They'll still be near nail prints. And when we enter heaven, and the God of heaven is on the throne, and Jesus walks out, and the multitudes are there, they'll be nail prints. The wounds aren't going to go away. But the job still got done. Now, if you want to spend your life, if we want to spend our lives being wounded and never do anything else, we can do that. But I'd rather do something with my life. You've heard the story of Abraham Lincoln. Failed running for Congress. Failed running for the Senate. Failed running for the governor. Failed in business. Failed, 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 failed. Ran for president. Became one of the most famous presidents America's ever had. You know why? He didn't hang around being a failure. He said, I'm going to commit myself to him who judgeth righteously. If you're seeking a world of righteousness and goodness, I can tell you where to find it. It's right after the trumpet sounds. I can tell you how to find a world that's fairer than day, where by faith we can see it afar. And there's golden streets and gates of pearl. There's a, it's a beautiful world and you'll never have a problem there again. But as long as you're on this world, there's injustice. It's in business. It's in the home. It's in marriage. You know, you, you said till death do us part. And your spouse had a drug problem, an alcohol problem. I led a family to Christ right up the street here some years ago. A nice family. And turned out the wife had a drug habit and just struggled and the husband told me, he said, I can't give her a dime. I can't leave any money. I have to take care of all the grocery, everything, because it'll get spent on drugs. And, and um, he said uh, one day he left some money with her to take the kids to the dentist. And he was at work, and he gave just enough money for the dentist appointment. He got home. The kids never went to the dentist, and she bought drugs. How do you live like that? I mean, the wound is there. And he just said, this is my wife. We're going to make it. 
and he didn't give her any money. You know, it's, you say, that's a horrible way to live. Well, it is horrible. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not even saying it's right. And by the way, if he'd have left her, I wouldn't have condemned him. That's between him and God. That's none of my business. I'm just saying this. This world will wound us. Car accidents. I remember I was right here in the, in the, in the office looking out the window. And one of our young men was driving his car up. The sun was, at the time of year, the sun's right in the, the windshield. It's school starting. And one of our young men pulled up and, and he stopped to make the left turn into to church here. And a, a car just flying up the road whipped past him and smashed his car. And here's a teenager, finally managed to get a car and it's totaled. And uh, the police came and did whatever, and, I, and, you know, and I, everybody was okay physically. His, the guy from our church, the teenager, his car was totaled. And the guy who hit him didn't have any insurance. And uh, got a ticket, no trouble. And he lived right up the street. I knew who he was. And within two weeks, he had a car driving. The kid in our church didn't have a car because his parents said, you wrecked it, you're going to save money and buy another one. And you think, the loser who caused the wreck, who didn't have insurance, he's driving while the good kid who's in a Christian school buying his own car, he's walking. I'm just telling you, you're going to be wounded. If you think you can get through this life without being wounded, you're crazy. And it could be, uh, could be cancer, it could be job, it could be unemployment, it could be the, any number of things go on. But the fact is, what are we going to do with our wounds? And we can, we can curl up in a corner. One of our ladies told me she lost her husband and she said, I pulled the blinds on the house and I curled up on the couch and stayed there for three months. She said, I just couldn't face it, didn't, didn't see her kids. Look, and she, she's the one who came and told me, we have to go. We have to, we have to have a life. We have to have a life. There's no way. She, she realized, I have been sitting here dying, wounded. But there's no healing living wounded. The healing comes here. Because when we get to heaven and see Jesus, you know what we're going to see in his hands? scars and scars are a wound that was healed I've got a couple if you want to see them but anyway they're all appropriate <laughs> I've been in the hospital someone said you want to see my scar no please don't <laughs> don't want to see nothing where they cut on you <laughs> but can I tell you something today God allows wounds I can't tell you all the whys. But the fact is, you're not going to go far in this Christian life without some wounds. And again, it could be, it could be your children. You know, God had Adam and Eve. They kind of messed things up. David had his own kids. I mean, the great man David, so many things. The Apostle Paul, just scribble it down if you want to look at it. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9. Paul said, God sent a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Here, the great apostle Paul, and God sends literally a messenger, and he said, I had a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, that I would not be exalted above measure. Paul had died at the city of Lystra. He'd been killed. People threw rocks at him until he died. He got to see some things in heaven that nobody would seen, and this is a real story where somebody really did get to heaven and get back. All those others I don't know about, but... He came back and he said he had this thorn in the flesh to keep him humble the rest of his ministry. He went on to say, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, if you and I get proud, God, God has made the rules. He'll humble you. But if you and I get humbled, God will exalt us. And so there's times, I remember one of our men um, had a very successful business. The first Gulf War broke out 90, uh, right around 1990, and he lost his business. He'd, he'd built a home, a beautiful home, and uh, they lost their home, and he was working at Lowe's for $8 an hour. He'd been a private contractor. But you know what happened? He kept teaching Sunday school, stayed in church, and little by little, he rebuilt things. But I'll tell you, you talk about a humble spirit. 
Because when you have everything together and you see somebody lose a house, you can say, oh, you know, maybe if you'd have done things more like me. But when you've been there, you don't say those things. Wait till tragedy's entered your world. You know, wait till you fall apart emotionally because of so much around you is going wrong. You know what's going to happen? You're going to walk into the world. You're going to start loving people. You know, I was watching those young girls sing up here. They're all kids. And um, just kids. And thinking about them when they were children. Some of them, several were here. And uh, three of them were here all their life. Teddy had to go outside to get a wife because we know Teddy. But, uh, and then I was looking at Mrs. Trewin, thinking of her husband and the friendships that uh, we had and, and the years she spent. And, and uh, there's some wounds that come. You, know, you lose somebody that you spent your life with. Uh, Paul and Gloria Young, I don't know how many times we've been to the cemetery with Paul and Gloria's relatives. I mean, when the trumpet sounds, Paul and Gloria's relatives are going to dominate the, uh, the exit from the Wildemar Cemetery. Uh, you know, a little, like a three-year-old Paul, right? A little three-year-old drowned. Wounds. Now, you got two choices. You either just focus on the wound the rest of your life. Or you say, there's a God in heaven who knows what's going on. And I may limp. Remember Jacob? He's coming back home from Laban's. He got his wife, his kids, his wealth. And he wrestles with an angel. And that night he made, he made things right with God. And the angel touched his hip and put it out of joint. And Jacob goes on with life, but he limps the rest of his life. It was his reminder. You need God. But you got to go on. You've got to go on. My wounds, your wounds, can either cripple us or they can leave us humble and we can go on and love people. I know this, when those jail services open back up and some of you get to go back preaching in the jail, no one in the jail is going to say, so how's the finances been in your family? <laughs> you know, Pat goes down to the jail to preach. Nobody's saying, so how's the marriage going, Pat? <laughs> You know what? They're just glad you're there to love them. That world out there. Yesterday, um, Ed uh, Lutz and, and Joel Paul, at least us two that I know were down helping Brett in the park service down there, and, and uh, 10 or 12 senior citizens walked to our, you know our Bible clubs we started for kids? You, Brett, where are you? You had, you had 11 seniors? It's a kids' Bible club. 11 senior citizens walk out of those senior citizen homes to come over to the park to sit down, and they were talking when, uh, when Ed said when they finally left, there were several still sitting there saying, it's just so nice to get out and see real people. <laughs> well, you know the reason Ed and Joel, were you there, Brother Beal? You know the reason though, all the three old guys visiting the old people? <laughs> None of those people are saying to any of these guys, how's your rheumatism? Or, you, know, <laughs> you know what? They're just glad that somebody came and loved them. I don't know what wounds you've got, but if you'll love people, your wounds will be kind of shifted to the background. I'm not saying they're going to go away, but I'm saying you can serve God wounded. And uh, the stories, we've got some here in the room I won't share. It's not my liberty, but we've got people here in this room who were wounded and went on in battle because it's what soldiers do. And as a child of God, that's what we're supposed to do. Let's just press on for God. Come back tonight. You'll hear the last half of that. Let's pray. Father, direct us tonight, today, as we uh, face this world that often wounds us. Maybe no one sees the wound, but it's in our heart. It's in our memories, but we have a good God. And perhaps we've been clinging to that wound, and maybe, again, we need to lift it up heavenward and say, God, I'm going to trust you with this. There's nothing else we can do. We can either embrace our wounds and, and stay there. We can commit it to him that judgeth righteously and realize God will use this wound to make me better. That God will use this wound to make me more helpful to others. Um, 
but I, I don't know, Lord. I just know we can trust you. I'm not going to go through this life not trusting you. And I pray that we as a church would not go through life not trusting you. That we would decide our God is faithful. And that if our wounds were necessary, then we're going to trust you with our wounds. And wounds of soul or wounds of heart, wounds of body. But we come to you today, Lord, knowing that we have a good God who's own son was wounded for our transgressions that Jesus died for us there's nothing good about the cross except that it was responsible for us being saved and multiplied millions will be in heaven because of Calvary and I pray that if today there's some wounds that we're going to have to press on that people will be in heaven because of our wounds that we would be a help to others, though we were wounded, and that you'd use our wounds for your glory, Lord. May we not forget we have a good God, a faithful God. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together just for a moment of invitation. You take a moment, just you and God. This, the instruments will play. An invitation here is very private between you and the Lord. taken time to look at the scriptures and before before we get busy with life stores food neighborhood activities we would just want to stop and take a moment you and God if you're not sure that heaven's your home and you'd like to talk to somebody about that I'd be happy to have someone talk with you this morning about how you could know for sure you're saved